This presentation focuses on the formation and structure of a new library makerspace professional collective and the process by which it has developed its identity and purpose, functionality, routines and activities, and plans for expansion and growth to serve libraries across the nation. My name is Pamela Van Helsema, and I am one of the project managers of this initiative which is in its first year and very much still under construction. I have a background in the arts, maker education, and libraries. I formerly worked as a teacher librarian in Petaluma, California at a large Title I junior high school. Along with my colleague, Lisa Regala, we have been working over the last five years to help support library maker programs here in California and now at the national level. Lisa and I are both makers and educators ourselves. Lisa is a scientist and I'm in the fine and applied arts. Together, we love supporting making in informal learning environments. Our external evaluator and collaboration partner is Scott Berg, senior researcher with Rockman et al., a cooperative firm that specializes in evaluation for education and nonprofits. We value and embed the use of evaluation to provide ongoing formative data that informs our project's next steps, and Scott's work has been incredibly essential to this process. You will hear from Scott and some of the data he has collected during this presentation today. To give you some background, our work began with California libraries, and over about three years, we supported a pilot group of 10 diverse libraries throughout the state to help them create sustainable community-driven maker programs. <laughs> All of these sites were chosen because they were under-resourced in some way. Perhaps they had very light staffing, their funding was very light, etc., or they were serving a high-needs community. What emerged out of that multi-year process were 10 very unique models for how maker programming can thrive in communities that may be overlooked. The end product of that on our part was a publication which all those libraries helped to develop, create, and test. It's called Makers in the Library and you can get it at any time downloaded from our website makersinthelibrary.org. We provided training and support for the development of these maker spaces and then turned around and formalized these methods in a toolkit with downloadable, very practical tools that any library could use. The end of that project coincided with the beginning of the pandemic and it was very hard for us to disseminate and share these resources at a time when libraries were faced with closing down, stopping programs, and really trying to join the world and figuring out what was possible and what was off limits. We do know that libraries did step into action and use some of their maker spaces at service during the time of the pandemic, using their 3D printers and and using their laser cutters and trying to make masks, make PPE, and serve the community in different ways, support educators doing distance learning. And there was a lot of innovation there. It made us curious. And we applied for a grant from IMLS, the Institute for Museum and Library Services, to really look closely at this. What's going on? What do these changes mean? And how can we support this innovation in maker spaces that's happening in libraries. I began working with uh, Pam and Lisa on the uh, makerspace project that was focused in California. I was the external evaluator on that project. We were assessing um, methods of design and implementation of maker spaces in for libraries that were under-resourced um, in urban, rural, and suburban communities. And that project led to the current IMLS grant, the current National Cooperative Grant, where I'm also serving as evaluator, more on a process evaluation, sort of looking at the process 
of how the uh, cooperative is being formed, um, expectations on the part of members, and the impact of uh, resources, programs, and activities that'll be developed over a period of about two years. And so that brings us to this project. It's called the New Face of Library Maker Spaces. And our website is, remains the same to find out more information about our progress. You can always go to our website, makersinthelibrary.org. So the project has three goals. First is to form a collective of libraries and library professionals who can support one another and share resources and together build new knowledge in service of community-centric maker programs. Community-centric is an important aspect of this because it's not a list of tools you buy and throw in a room in the library. Instead, it's really looking at your community, what capacity and interest there are for making things, whether that be anywhere from engineering, computer science, and high tech to tra traditional maker ways that may be rooted in culture, that may be rooted in history, that may be rooted in whatever the economic driver of the area is, whether it could be agriculture, it could be <clears throat> entertainment, it could be um, any sort of thing, but community-centered maker programs that are built from the ground up. And when we say diverse, we do not really only talk about race and ethnicity here. We're talking about big libraries and small, urban libraries, suburban and rural libraries, libraries that serve tribal uh, communities, libraries that serve <clears throat> uh, very ethnically diverse libraries with many languages and many traditions versus libraries that, that don't have that. Um, we know that libraries all over the country vary widely and at times can the people who work there can be somewhat isolated from what's happening elsewhere unless we build these opportunities for connection. And we think sharing the unique things that are going on and helping um, learn together in the way of maker programming and maker spaces uh, will be a useful and valuable opportunity for those who really care about these programs. We also hope to identify what tools, resources, and strategies were innovated and adapted during the pandemic. We know a lot changed and a lot of cool things happened. A lot of things were tried that didn't work too. So we're endeavoring to collect that information, interview libraries, do surveys, do some research, and really figure out what the best things are that worked and find out if people will still continue to do them even post pandemic. And then lastly, we want to share some professional development opportunities and develop those in collaboration with our collective members so that more uh, new libraries who haven't been able to sustain or even start a maker program at their library can learn how to do it. And we endeavor to support that kind of development for new and emerging library staff who want to do this work. And at the same rate, continue to support those who have many years of experience in this. And so it's relevant to all levels of maker educators who work in libraries. And just to touch on what we mean by makers and what we mean by maker spaces, um, we have a very liberal and broad view of what that looks like. Um, there can be many models for doing making in a library. Uh, you may have a dedicated space which offers the opportunity to engage with tools, materials, and activities that are science, technology, arts, or you may not have that space in a library, but it's something that's set up just in time for a program 
um, a facilitated program or an open-ended program. There might also be a library that does this as an outreach project and brings this out to schools, to nursing homes, to clubs, into the community, to the farmer's market, and that's more of a mobile program. Whether it's in a crate in the back of the library staff member's car, or if it's in a fancy vehicle, or if it's on the back of a bike, there's many ways to bring your maker program into the community. Um, those spaces, as you can see, aren't necessarily dedicated rooms. I'm talking about making space and time in your, in your library's schedule, in your staff member's workload, and space in the community so that people have a chance to participate in open-ended activities that provide access to tools, opportunities to learn and explore, and invitations to collaborate and share what they're doing. Our Board of Advisors provides expert advice and includes Maggie Mello, a researcher and scholar on access and diversity in make makerspaces, Kelly Deppin, a practicing librarian who is the official representative for this project from our partner, the Association of Rural and Small Libraries, Christina Fuller -Greg Gregory, a librarian maker who is a leader in the profession on EDI training and policy, Rafi Santo, a researcher and expert in the structure and function of learning com communities, Vera Michalczyk from the Connected Learning Lab, and Jerry Valadez, whose organization, the Community Science Workshop, offers STEM informal education opportunities for youth in rural areas. <clears throat> to understand how we are building this project um, and the collaborative, uh, we are starting with Tier 1 and selecting charter libraries across the country who can be institutional members and founding members of this organization. They, they already are building the internal structure of the organization and have been with us since January of this year. Tier two will be starting in the fall where we will bring in ambassadors who will be regionally uh, selected regionally and also their ability to bring people together. Um, around these things, grassroots leaders. And lastly, we'll be inviting, especially via the ambassadors, inviting any library staff member to become involved. And hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have a good solid start to the end of year two, I should say, a good solid start to building this um, membership of the collective itself. The charter members are a group of seven libraries chosen through an application and interview process from locations across the USA, representing both large and small public libraries with maker programs that were active during the pandemic. They became institutional members of the collective, serving as geographic hubs from which the collective might grow in later phases of the organization. Half of these leaders hailed from small or rural libraries. And it was significant to have institutional members at this point because we were able to engage multiple representatives from each library as part of the planning process. You know, I think that what they were most interested in doing is having a forum, which they didn't have outside of their own communities, localities, maybe state, not so often, but they each said that, well, there's nothing like this. And we don't have, you know, we like to, we can't, you know, it's the idea of collective learning. And um, and one, one thing that they did bring up in the early stages is that they felt that finally, you know, that, that to some degree that their knowledge and experience is being validated and that they feel they have some value now and you know, when you have a, a, a group of individuals who feel valued as professionals who are energized by this concept. We spent some time unpacking the word collective and what it means organizationally and functionally, as well as exploring the background and structure of 
other organizations that provide networked support for professional groups, especially in the context of education or maker professions. Our advisory board member, Rafi Santo, provided us with his research, and that really helped us define what kind of collective we sought to build. We used this help from him to guide us and inform our first stages of this work. And so when you ask the question, what kind of collective are we building? From the various different models, we realized we wanted to build what's called, what he calls an innovation, improvement, and knowledge building network, where there's no single highly specified program of practice that in the entire network focuses on at once but rather emergent and ongoing focal points for various subgroups within the network and varying degrees of coordinated action around those different issues. A key part of this model is that it allows great ideas and initiatives to emerge from members of the organization, a more grassroots empowerment approach, yet still be connected and collaborative too. So you might be wondering, how do you go about building a distributed diverse professional network. Well, here's how we got started. From the start in January, 2022, time and attention were invested in first building relationships within the charter group, offering opportunities to talk virtually to one another in small groups using Zoom or, or having phone calls and share details about their libraries and programs with each other. Remember, these libraries did not know each other before. Twice a month Zoom meetings for the whole group followed up with conversations via Slack and Zoom and sharing information and drafting plans using Google Drive helped us to discover how we might work collaboratively during this formation period. We used evaluation as a helpful tool and through interviews, our evaluator found that the libraries actually did appreciate once they got into it, laying this firm foundation from the beginning. Each of the charter members um, had been involved at their own local level in some sort of resource sharing and were very eager for this kind of program to really leverage their own experience and knowledge and really be able to help other libraries across the country um, develop and sustain maker spaces. So they, they were very excited. These were kinds of individuals who uh, were excited about starting projects from the ground up, innovators, risk takers. Um, and in that respect, they didn't have a lot of expectations or they didn't really hold the cooperative concept to a lot of expectations early on because they I think they understood they had maybe a mature understanding of what it would take. And the fact that um, a number of the goals would be uh, to sort of create the norms and operating processes um, of the collective. And so when I asked about goals, it was really focused on, say, two phases. The first being process oriented, um, creating the relationships, building trust, um, establishing communication um, that would lead to uh, a foundation of an organization that could expand and um, involve other libraries at a later point in time, but they they understood that that was a primary short term goal again that creation and the necessity of of doing that process work right away and then and the longer term goals would evolve over time. Uh, all of all of the uh, charter members who I interviewed, they all concurred about the importance of establishing norms um, as a for a number of reasons. Um, they are all coming from different geographic areas. Their libraries are different sizes, they have different experiences. I mean, establishing a makerspace in a rural library in Arkansas is different than creating one in a more suburban library in Denver, or Providence, Rhode Island. And so communication, the, kind of the staff and colleagues that they were communicating with may be different in coming into this sort of collective space. So in order to do work uh, collaboratively, they all understood that it was important that norms be established um, with respect to how one communicates, um, understanding roles and responsibilities, uh, assuming a certain kind of risk and responsibility. But um, I, again, I think this was a very, and I have to credit the um, 
organizers of the collective and the selection process, it's a very savvy group in understanding that um, norm setting was really a, a sort of precursor to establishing roles and building trust. And that if you don't have trust with individuals that you know and create these relationships, um, nothing's going to be done. In my own work as an evaluator, one of the key things that I have to do, um, you know, I come into a situation and someone sees, here's the word evaluation, they get a little nervous. And so it's important that you kind of establish who you are, um, what you're there to do, the support you're going to provide. And, and uh, all of the individuals understood that, that in order for this, and also as a way, as a way to maintain uh, create sustainability in the organization so that norms would be created so that when other groups come in, there was a foundation. You can't build a house without a framework. So as we continue to develop new expectations and goals, they would relate to various stages and stakeholders for the initiative. First, we set up a productive system of working together as a cohort group, just the charter member libraries, that center circle. Then in year two, we have plans to bring in more leaders, as I mentioned earlier, the ambassadors that will help with the growth and also representation to more folks. The group is still defining and working hard now on the member experience, that teal color ring, how individuals, not libraries, but individuals will be members of this organization when, when it, once it's um, opened up to membership and what avenues for connection, collaboration, and growth will be established to facilitate that. But there's always also in the back of our minds a larger vision to bring more awareness and support for the work of library maker programs in the field and to change who it is who's making, who leads, and better represent the communities that these libraries serve in the larger field of librarianship and making. So the group set to working norms and processes for their le the leadership group, that center circle on how we would work together as charter members. And if we would make consensus-based decisions about how and what we would work on and prioritize at this beginning stage of the organization. Also worked on crafting an identity and structure for the group, which we're gonna describe in more detail. And then while the collective has started out with public libraries, I just wanted to note that the project holds on to a long-term vision for encapsulating other types of libraries in this collective, including academic and school libraries, tribal libraries, and more. It's just at these beginning stages, the interest level was very high in public libraries. And so that's where we began. Um, and one of the goals, I think stated goals, is to inform the field about uh, opportunities and challenges in the space, what other libraries are doing. So to that effect, um, uh, we worked with um, the, the, the team, the evaluation, I, I should say, uh, team, all uh, charter members and staff are all involved in every facet of the evaluation in terms of instrument development, uh, analysis, reporting, everybody reviews reports. So evaluation is like not standing over in one corner or is, you know, a prescriptive process, which for, again, that would be inconsistent with the philosophy. I, you know, I firmly believe that, um, and we've been applying that, that um, evaluation has to be embedded and it has to be a capacity, building a capacity for these um, uh, members and their organizations, you know, rather than just, okay, let's wait for the evaluation. They have to be part of it and see how it works. And, and I think that that, again, that's part of that collective learning experience. So that- The process began with defining our values as a collective. And to do that defining, we started with a personal values inventory. Here's a representation of what came forward when we did that work. 
And then we compared those with value statements that came from the American Library Association as the core values of librarianship, the professional values that we adhere to. And we looked at core values of the maker movement. These came from core principle statements at the Nation of Makers, who, as I mentioned before, is one of our partners in this project. From those, charter members work to clarify and distill these into three areas. I'll allow Kennedy, one of our librarians from Evanston, Illinois, define those for you. As library maker staff, we are in a constant state of learning and growth. Because we don't know everything, we want to offer a network to share knowledge, resources, and mentorship. Members are open and supportive of different approaches to learning. The Collective is a place for everyone, no matter their race and ethnicity, religious beliefs, sexual orientation, gender identification, socioeconomic status, age, or physical or mental ability. We treat members fairly and respectfully. People are valued based on their distinctive skills, experiences, and perspectives. We recognize and embrace the uniqueness of each individual and their contributions to the collective. We make sure our meetings and events are accessible to all members of the collective. We come together as professionals regardless of position or titles in support of learning and each other. This collective is a work in progress and will continue to adapt to the needs of its members as we grow and the world around us changes. Yeah. Um, they, they are concerned with helping libraries that may not have, say, the resources of some uh, you know, libraries in, in more affluent areas um, and who may have access to other educational opportunities and um, marginalized communities as well. So th there is a strong sense of um, applying principles of diversity and equity and inclusion. I know those are big terms, but really enabling and, and empowering libraries that may not be able to, on their own, um, create these spaces. To build our organization, we searched for a framework or guide to get the work done. We decided to use this resource called the Community Canvas. It seemed the best model to both be comprehensive enough and applicable to our organization type. It divides the work into three distinct areas, identity, experience, and structure. Likewise, we divided our charter members into subcommittees to tackle these three areas. We found with our remote working via Zoom that engaged one another in small groups was far more productive and our librarians also enjoyed working in small groups of five or six instead of in a larger group. In accordance with our desire to become a welcoming community and one that welcomed input from everyone, we learned that they found it harder to speak up in the larger group meetings. But in the smaller group, everyone felt happy to share and participate. At the same time, folks wanted to know what the other groups were doing. So we still hold larger meetings so that these three groups, identity, experience, and structure, can report back to others, collect feedback. And often that feedback comes asynchronously via Google Drive or text or Slack, if not in the meeting itself. We feel like that these discoveries are important to remember and continue to take into account as our organization grows and aims to be a welcoming place for new members and so that they feel comfortable sharing their ideas and input. So I'll give you a little background on what some of these three groups are engaged in at the moment and what they've accomplished so far. About member identity, one of the questions asked is who is this community really for? And if it's not clear to you already from what I've said, here's some more detail. What is the profile of the community's most active members? So we're saying that we want the people to join this collective who are actually employed or involved with, it could be as a volunteer with a library and being part of the makerspace or maker program staff. 
and we are sensitive to using the word maker space. We include that, but we also want to say maker program in case maker space implies a dedicated room in a library. We do not mean it that way, but we know people interpret it that way. Um, so a maker program or maker staff. We also feel like those who will be part of this should or would have a passion for making, especially the most active members, a personal uh, motivation for being there. Um, we hope that they're innovative, looking for new ways to do things. They're organized, engaged, and networked because that's why you join this, so that you can connect with others who are doing the work. They have an enthusiasm for helping others and embrace the maker mindset. Um, they're leaders in program development, advocacy, makerspace management, outreach, accessibility, and or space creation and most likely focused on public libraries, but we do not want to limit it if somebody from a different uh, uh, type of library would like to join. We just feel like most likely the most active, the most visible, the most um, uh, actively engaged in contributing members, at least at the start, will be those who are in public library spaces. And then what are we really hoping to achieve? Um, well, we hope to connect and support library maker staff of all levels of experience. And so if folks are new, we don't expect that they are going to be the ones sharing the most, although they can. Um, and we do hope that those who have the most experience are happy to answer questions and contribute as well. Recognize the experience and strengths that library maker staff, maker staff bring to the collective. And that's really important because it may be the first time that that acknowledgement is coming through to library maker staff. Um, it could be that they are not getting that kind of acknowledgement and support. So we would like to amplify that and highlight that and shine a spotlight on those strengths and experience and what they contribute to the community, to their patrons and to the institution, um, their library, as well as the, the field. And we hope that we can create a self and uh, safe and welcoming space so that no matter what the question, there's no dumb question to ask. Um, there's a really experienced group who can give great tips, information and resources. And then lastly, we wanna equip and advance library professionals to be leaders. So support them in writing grants, support them in in doing research, support them in developing new ways to do things and prototyping and testing and sharing and building together. Um, so we also hope to provide professional development, professional development opportunities or help point people in the direction of professional development opportunities so that no matter where you are, you may have those connections and access to knowledge so that you can grow professionally um, via the library makerspace work. Now about identity, not just our purpose and, and who we're serving, but what do we call ourselves? And our grant has a name, our website has a different name. Um, our project in California had a name, but they're all different names. And the collective itself has had um, some ad hoc names, but we really are working right now on naming our organization and coming up with um, an identity, a logo, a style. And we're not sure what that is yet. So we just are in the process of selecting our designer who we're going to work with. And that's going to take us through the summer. And by September, we're hoping um, the identity subgroup is working on that and we are hoping to have that complete so that in the fall when we bring on our ambassadors and we try to do more public facing work, we can do that with a consistent and appealing and exciting new um, visual brand. 
our structure group has been working um, on that scaffolding and that foundation. So first of all, looking at the roles and responsibilities of members and leaders in the collective itself and how decisions will get made. So who gets to make decisions and how we make decisions and what authority is delegated and to whom and how we decide on things. Are we going to vote? Are we going to need consensus on certain topics and certain, certain types of issues? And also, what if we can't reach consensus or if there's a tie vote, how do we take that into account? It's a little bit like bylaws, a little bit of processes, but also it's really gonna be really important for such a distributed group that um, is hoping to grow uh, that we have these things figured out. So they're really working on that right now, as well as looking into the future. Um, right now we have our grant and we have a backbone organization and some partners, but that does not mean it'll stay the same after the grant ends after uh, 2023. And so looking at what would make sense for um, keeping this going and going strong after this initial phase. Uh, they're exploring other organizations that may provide a backbone, an administrative backbone for the collective. Um, also seeking next stages of funding sources and funding models and looking at will members pay a fee to be part of the collective will libraries pay a fee to be part of the collective will sponsor or grants really cover those operational costs all of those things are being explored now and and it's like i said still in um very it's important work but it's still in the uh, exploration stages and the other thing the structure group is looking at as we're deciding what kinds of activities will take place among members and for members, what the right um, uh, platforms and communication channels are for, for hosting that work. We already have some things set up. Um, we already are a member of some Slack groups. We are a member of, we have a makers in the library website, whether that continues to be one of the sites that's used for a blogging platform or another hub for information or not. Um, we're deciding those things. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot to take into consideration about that. Also taking into consideration data management. When you build a membership organization, you're going to collect information from your members and you are also going to be sharing resources. And what does that mean to be collecting resources and sharing resources? Well, of course, librarians do this professionally, um, but as an organization, what are our privacy policies? What is the respect, responsible collection and storage of information and resources that provides just the right amount of access to things, but also protects um, uh, valuable assets and information, um, uh, intellectual property, though, and also at the same time supports networking, knowledge sharing, and that open-endedness. So it's um, two different ends of the spectrum that both have to be taken into account. As we All this talk of building an organization, but what are we actually doing and what are we actually talking about? What will be the area of focus for the collective and what problems will the group tackle? Well, you may be wondering this, so let me share a bit on how we're getting into that. And it's really focused on the group called experience. What is the experience? What are the habits, the routines, and the activities that members will engage in? And what will we be delivering as a collective to the, to the uh, realm of library maker work? Well, as I mentioned early on, that one of the goals was to survey libraries in regard to how their program content and models of program delivery shifted over the pandemic. What new innovations did they try? How did they work and what was necessary for staff to learn in order to carry these ideas forward? And will these programs continue post pandemic? 
So we're analyzing the results of a survey that we carried out, and we will share our findings at the end of the summer. The findings will also inform some of our work of the collective going forward as we define and refine best practices around this type of programming, curate resources, and share what's really happening in libraries around the country. We also think it's important to celebrate those who took risks and innovated in the hardest of circumstances to serve their communities with creativity and flexibility. And so again, it's another way to advocate for the value of library maker spaces. Libraries were you know, clearly challenged um, what had they have been used to in a face-to-face -face, um, situation um, was no longer possible for about two years. And so they tried a lot of different methods. You know, a lot of them had to abandon, a number of them had to abandon, but a surprisingly large number, um, you know, and I heard you hear this word all the time, really did pivot to different, different kinds of programs, uh, thinking about how to relate differently to their constituents or their patrons. Um, it was more tra less transactional, I think. I mean, what you find in makerspaces in general is that it really moves the librarian away from sort of that transactional, here's your book, here's your whatever, uh, to more of a, um, almost a coach or a mentor or, or a peer in some respects. So there's a lot of that sort of change the nature of the relationships. It, it uh, enabled libraries to think about different kinds of maker programming um, and think about their space differently to the point now where uh, they're applying a lot of the, the and also new training and skills. You know, so every organization I work with, you know, it's like, well, now we have to learn how to do something different, you know, in, virtually. So uh, training improved. Um, I think um, the idea of what a makerspace is uh, also changed. Um, it allowed them to connect with communities and individuals, maybe individuals who couldn't come to the library. Um, and again, that's one of the, the goals here is to bring different members of the community in. Um, so it got people thinking differently about that. And now, um, again, thinking about this period, which is totally unpredictable, but you're seeing a mix of you know, what worked maybe pre-pandemic and uh, methods and types of engagements that work during the pandemic period. We're not totally out of that yet. And, and we're sort of re really redefining the space. So I think that it shows it's a value added of the work and, and the charter members and, you know, can take that data and inform it with their own experience. So ultimately it can go out as a report, here are the findings and we'll be publishing that soon. Um, but also as a member of this collective, you know, you can point to a particular finding and then provide that experience. It's not an isolated, everyone's gone through it. So I think we're providing, or the collective is providing information and knowledge to the field, but also, also has the opportunity to elaborate on that, to, to um, expand on that. Because sometimes, you know, survey is just a point in time and two months later it's done. And I think the expectation is that um, this will be kind of an ongoing, maybe not every continue to do surveys, but to use that data and to create other resources based on what we're learning nationally. So I think it was a very good first effort on the part of the collective to um, establish itself as a, um, as a source for information, um, both um, in a reflective state, but also prospective. And I'm sure there'll be some work that we'll be doing looking at trends as well. But all these trends are obviously informed by what's happened in the current past. Our libraries worked together to define six common problems of practice that exist for all types of library maker programs and maker spaces. And are setting these up as areas to work on as a collective. The first is making a case for the program itself. 
Making is not clearly defined and therefore it's difficult to convey its role in libraries to the people within the library, to your own administration and board, and then to potential funders, community members, and others who may want to engage if they only knew its value, if they only knew how wonderful making and maker spaces can be. And so we may engage in research and collecting um, and defining that case so that it can be shared and can be used by library maker spaces, no matter where you are. Um, and our collective can work on that advocacy work together. The second problem defined is related to marketing and attracting new audiences. This kind of outreach exposure and inviting um, media that can bring people in um, is not always easy to achieve and not every library has a marketing department or has people that can do that outreach outside the walls of the library, um, especially in smaller and rural libraries, it's very challenging, but collectively, if together we could work on strategies and work on media that can be shared and used, how might we be able to um, help with that kind of uh, visibility and also make these um, outreach and marketing messaging and visuals be appropriate and culturally relevant to the folks that you're really trying to invite to your program. The third program is about overcoming cultural and socio socioeconomic barriers to engaging in the library program itself. That has something to do with the design of the space as well as the design of the program content and delivery. Maybe your program needs to take place outside the walls of your library and go to where the people are, um, whether they have physical um, limitations for accessing the library, or maybe it's there's no public transportation or no way for them to get there. Um, maybe there's language barriers, maybe all kinds of things could be the case. Um, and how could that problem be addressed in the actual design and delivery of the maker program itself. Problem number four has to do with staff training and confidence and professional growth opportunities for people who work in libraries specifically in this type of program and this type of work. Um, there isn't a shared established framework for training library personnel in delivering this kind of STEAM, STEM, arts, DIY work. And so this is definitely something that our collective could help develop and disseminate in the library profession. Nor is there really a step-by-step -step area of, um, and pathway for growth professionally. Um, and we hope that this collective could provide some of those pathways for recognition and, and advancement for all kinds of library makerspace people, regardless of where you are. And we feel like some of the areas and the people, some of the rural areas that weren't at hubs that had tech, um, that, had, that were the emergent places of the maker movement when it began 15 years ago or so, maybe those opportunities didn't exist. So if we could expand the opportunity to be involved in those, as a professional organization that would help meet some of our goals and mirror our values. Okay, problem number five has to do with operational challenges that just exist for delivering these programs at your library. And if we can share resources, methodologies, systems, um, the policies, the, the, the safety protocols, um, just share those so that they're easier to achieve and easier to implement and easier to train staff. Um, that does help with sustainability as well because you're not reinventing the wheel all the time. Um, some people are very inventive, especially during COVID of, mm, we're gonna have to shift our, shift our operations, obviously. Let's share those inventions. Let's share what work, worked and also share what some things that weren't working and possibly um, what those factors were that made it so that they didn't work. Any kind of professional organization that has a platform so that folks can um, give and take and, and uh, dialogue around the challenges and opportunities could be a benefit um, and really help support innovation and support progress and um, limit the challenges next time around. 
And the sixth problem that we address uh, is sustainability. Um, the limited resources available for this type of programming, um, limited resources available for staffing, limited resources available to support keeping the, the machines um, and tools and materials available and in good condition and maintained and any kind of funding so that more people can take advantage of these programs um, is always a challenge. So how could our collective work together to find new sources of uh, funding for the programs and share that wealth so that we can all um, feel confident that we have a pathway in the coming years and that our our programs have a firm foundation and resources to make them happen. So in order to address those different problems of practice, we could do that in so many different ways. And we are not dictating one way or two ways in order to do that. And we're allowing the charter members right now to start uh, doing some prototyping on <clears throat> ways to do the work. And we will keep an open mind on what are successful and appropriate ways to do the work on these pro problems of practice. You heard the example of us starting out with the COVID survey by delivering a survey and now reporting on that survey. And then we'll be taking the survey results to build on new opportunities based on what we've learned. And they, those um, things that we're building may take the form of video, may take the form of blogs, may take the form of, you know, program uh, models or examples um, or templates. They may um, take the form of gathering groups together and having a little mini conference about some of those findings. Um, we are keeping an open mind and we want to listen very closely to the people who will be members of the library collective and find out what is accessible and successful and the most useful to them. We're keeping an open mind to that and that's why assessment and evaluation is so very important throughout our process as well. We want to always listen um, and find what works and what's helpful and what's of value. Members will want to be members of the collective if they find that it adds value to their professional life. And that is definitely um, our goal here. So these are just some examples of types of en engagement and types of media and types of opportunities and routines that we may offer. Um, but it certainly isn't going to be limited to these choices. These are just some of the options. What we'd like to ask you is, have we captured the problems of practice in an accurate way? And did we forget something? Did we mischaracterize something? We would love your input. We also want to ask how we might leverage our collective power to address these challenges. Perhaps we haven't imagined what might be possible. Um, and if you have experience or ideas or want to be involved in this effort, we very much want to talk to you. And so we invite your ideas and feedback. And probably the easiest way to do that at this moment is to email us at info at makersinthelibrary.org. And uh, Lisa and I will share that with uh, our charter members and we will definitely take a close look and take that to heart and figure out how to move forward in the best possible way in the coming year as we look to solidify our structure and begin building and expanding and reaching out and more broadly. So I think you know that that will certainly be a that will certainly be a challenge going forward. I mean, the work so far has been, um, you know, the fundamental work has really been solid. Everybody is really on board. But members, charter members, do recognize that um, there these are you know substantive challenges: funding, new membership, changes in the external environment. You know, you have to be able to. You know, who knows? I mean, the external environment is so unpredictable. We didn't know about COVID. We don't know what the next thing is going to be. So um, there's a lot of unknowns that, you know, and how the collective goes about sort of establishing a little more definition, continue to while acting at the same time, can you do both? Um, you know, and there's a lot to do uh, by the end of the grant. And just one last invitation to connect and contact our team. Again, um, I gave you our gen general 
email in that last uh, slide, but here we have Lisa Regala, um, Pamela Van Helsema, that's myself, and Scott Berg, our direct email addresses. And also to note that we have a Makers in the Library Facebook group, which is on, um, has about, I, I think at this point, about 750 members around the country, and you are more than welcome to join that and chime in um, and be part of the community already. And so I just wanted to thank you for being, being here, listening to what we have to say, and invite you to engage with us and be part of this work because we believe that library maker spaces are here for the community and they're a great value and connecting those folks who are doing this work is of great value and helps with the profession in general. Thank you very much. Thank you.